Okay, as we're getting the opportunity to kind of wrap up dinner, I hope you've enjoyed our buffet this evening. Uh, if possible, please feel free to go back and get another slice of cake before you're done tonight. Uh, and please do enjoy the complimentary bottles of wine we have on the table. I want to make sure that you uh, enjoy that and enjoy your experience here tonight. Um, on behalf of Washburn Law School and the Center for Law and Government, I am very pleased both to uh, have our speaker here this evening and also to introduce and bring up a special guest to in turn introduce um, our keynote speaker for this evening. That person I'd like to introduce is Secretary Chris Kobach. Um, we are pleased here in Kansas to have one of the national prominent figures in regards to immigration law, uh, both involved in our conference today and also serving us as our Secretary of State. Secretary Kobach, could you come up? Well, I think the uh, reason that I get the honor of introducing our uh, esteemed speaker tonight is that I'm a former student of his. And so there aren't too many opportunities when a uh, student gets to uh, introduce a former professor. Uh, but this is one of them, so I'm going to enjoy the moment. Um, he is, uh, the, the, his official title is the Simeon Baldwin Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Um, I thought he had a dual appointment because he spends a lot of his time at NYU Law School as well. But he is in such high demand that he is a regular visiting professor at NYU Law School. Such a regular visiting professor that they gave him an apartment uh, right next to the law school, and in New York, getting an apartment is no small thing. And uh, only he had it for 10 years, and only recently have they said, uh, well, would, you, would you please let somebody else use this apartment, even though he comes back constantly. So that he's, he is a fixture both at Yale Law School and at NYU Law School. Um, he's also served as deputy dean at Yale Law School. Um, he, his, his major fields of, of teaching and research are, of course, uh, immigration law, uh, tort law, administrative law, and then some of the more uh, smaller subfields like diversity uh, in the law as well. Uh, he's a prolific writer, and uh, if you haven't seen any of his books, uh, then you haven't been in, a, uh, in the law section of a bookstore recently because he's pretty much always got something interesting that's either forthcoming uh, or that's, been, that's sort of a, a, something that's been on the shelves for a while. Now, some of the more recent uh, books include, I love this title, uh, Meditations of a Militant Moderate, Cool Views on Hot Topics. Uh, he's also uh, got Immigration Stories, uh, Foundations of Administrative Law, uh, Diversity in America, Keeping Government at a Safe Distance, uh, Essays, uh, The Limits of Law, Essays on Democratic Governance, uh, Targeting in Social Programs, Avoiding Bad Bets, rem Removing Bad Apples. If those titles don't entice you to read something he's written, then you must not be very interested in the law, because he's, he's just written about a lot of really great topics and, and written very well about them. Um, prior to joining Yale, uh, he was Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Um, he holds a BA from Cornell, a JD from Harvard Law, an LLM in International Law from NYU, and an MA in Government from Harvard. Um, now to the important part, um, what you really need to know about Professor Shuck is that uh, in the field of immigration law, and specifically uh, immigration law academia, um, I would say that it is uh, not indisputable, but because uh, there's always law lawyers who will dispute anything, but I would say it's pretty close to indisputable that he is the preeminent figure uh, among professors of immigration law in America. I think if you ask them to rank who's the, who is the number one dude in this field, the, one, the, the, the most established, respected professor in the field, uh, I am quite confident that Professor Shuck would, would get the most votes. Um, and what's interesting about that is that uh, immigration law is a field where I would say 90% plus of the professors take a more um, uh, non-restrictive, open border type view. Uh, of the field, and maybe one or two percent take a more law enforcement view, and, and, and maybe, you know, four to six percent take a, a moderate balanced view, and Professor Shuck leads from that, that balanced, you know, perspective. So he's not in the, necessarily the majority um, of, of where the views fit in that spectrum, but nonetheless he is so highly respected uh, among his peers for good reason, uh, because of his great writing, great teaching, uh, and insight on the topic. Uh, aside from all of that, he is also a genuinely great person. 
And uh, I have never heard any Yale law student say anything bad about Professor Shuck, and I know a great many uh, law students at Yale, of my colleagues uh, at that time, and, and people since who just who, who have gotten to know him and know that he is a truly uh, great human being and a real gentleman. And so it's with great pr pleasure that I introduce Professor Peter Shuck. Thank you for that wonderful and undeserved uh, introduction. Um, Chris is actually sucking up to me because <laughs> he didn't uh, hand in his, his final paper, and <laughs> so he's, he's helping out forget about that. Um, and I have. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of the conference uh, that, that's being held here at Washburn. I thank very much the uh, the dean and and the uh, professor Robinson and professor Rubenstein and and, and Sean and anybody else who's been involved with the uh, convening of the conference and inviting me here uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor and uh, I hope I will uh, be able to uh, provide some interesting material for you uh, after your meal uh, I've Call the uh, talk I I Immigration Policy, Myths, Realities, and Reforms. And I thought I would emphasize uh, some of the different aspects of immigration policy that I think are not uh, well understood. So uh, I'm dividing the talk into four parts, introduction, and then some myths and misunderstandings about immigration, uh, and then some thoughts about immigration reform, and finally, some concluding remarks. Uh, I view the Immigration Act of 1965 as probably the most important nation-shaping statute ever enacted. It's a very strong statement, uh, but I think in terms of, uh, of shaping uh, the future of our nation, there is none that is more important than that. Uh, certainly none, with possible exception of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and uh, one of the interesting things about the Immigration Act of 1965, it was, it was adopted very much in the wake of and in the spirit of uh, the Civil Rights uh, Movement. Um, on a comparative basis, America is by far the most immigrant-friendly nation in the world. Indeed, there aren't very many countries in the world that have immigration policies in the sense of uh, uh, accepting uh, immigrants uh, on a basis other than their ethnic uh, relationship or colonial uh, uh, experience um, with, uh, with the mother country. Uh, Canada does accept more legal immigrants uh, than uh, the United States does as a percentage of its population, and Sweden, uh, which has only 9 million people, has accepted 30,000 refugees. So on a percentage basis, those are very generous countries as well, but they're also very, very different from the United States in, in, in some important respects. And I would say that our immigration policy has been much more, shall I say, courageous uh, in terms of potential political and social and ethnic uh, conflicts uh, that arise, inevitably arise from immigration. Um, so for those of you who, the, part the participants in the conference uh, uh, know these uh, figures well, but for the rest of you, I'll just lay out a few parameters of our immigration uh, policy today. Uh, the first is that we admit about a million, a little bit more than a million legal permanent residents every uh, year. And we have about 12.5 million LPRs, as we call them, living in the United States uh, today. Uh, of course, a lot of the LPRs have naturalized uh, over time. Uh, we're the most diverse country of origin distribution uh, uh, in the world and uh, the most uh, diverse distribution uh, that we've ever had in this country today. Uh, we, in, in addition to the uh, 1 million LPRs, we uh, admit uh, about 100,000 humanitarian uh, 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 admissions, that is to say refugees and asylees, uh, each year. Uh, and that's a very large number uh, relative to uh, any other country uh, in, in the world. Again, Sweden has done a remarkable job in accepting refugees. 
um, given its uh, very small population. But the United States, in terms of the total magnitudes, is, uh, is alone. Um, now, I want to make a couple of points about uh, the relationship of immigrants to the United States. Uh, they assimilate faster here than in the few other receiving countries that actually admit immigrants as, as uh, distinguished from ex ex accepting uh, asylum claimants occasionally or admitting uh, their co-ethnics uh, from other countries. Uh, I believe that this has much more to do with the nature of our civil society and our culture and our political values uh, than, uh, than it does the law. Um, and I discuss this a, a great deal in my book, Diversity in America, explain the variety of reasons why the United States has been relatively successful uh, in integrating uh, immigrants for a very long time, although our history, of course, is studded with some uh, grave injustices, uh, exclusions, um, and uh, discrimination that existed uh, until uh, really until the 1960s. Uh, but uh, I think the, the nature of our uh, polity and its relationship to immigration has changed dramatically in the, in the last uh, 45 years. One very striking feature that uh, distinguishes the United States from any other country with respect to immigration is that we are the only country in the world with no nativist or restrictionist party. Uh, the Republican Party is uh, strikingly and importantly divided on the immigration issue. Uh, uh, Secretary Kobach uh, is, a, is a major participant in the debate within the Republican Party. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, there is no significant element of the Republican Party or indeed of any other part of American politics uh, that is what we would call nativist or, uh, or xenophobic. Uh, there, are, there are groups uh, and elements that uh, would rather restrict immigration uh, beyond the current uh, levels, but that's a very different, uh, very different thing. Uh, public opinion is ambivalent about immigration, and this has always been true. That is to say, the general view in, uh, among the American public today, and, and uh, as far back as uh, we uh, know from uh, uh, public opinion polling on this issue, um, is to the effect that uh, we're very, very proud of our immigration history. Uh, we are very, very uh, admiring of the immigration experience in the United States and of those immigrants whom we know. Uh, but we want less immigration than we've had in the past or than that Americans believe exists uh, now. Uh, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. But too much of a good thing uh, is, uh, is not uh, such a good thing. And I think that's the, the basic view of most Americans about uh, immigration. Uh, now, turn to the myths uh, and misunderstandings about immigration. I call them misunderstandings as well as myths because, in some cases, uh, uh, there it, it's not so much that people believe something that's not true. It's just that they don't understand the context in which it's necessary to think about these issues in order to comprehend their uh, their significance and their underlying uh, 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 factual basis. So, um, what do I do here? I see I have the, they're a bit out of order here. Uh, okay, well, on, on my sheets, they're out of order. Uh, first is that immigration is a dominant hot button issue for most Americans. Um, and certainly, reading the papers, one might. Uh, uh, believe that's the case, but in fact, it's pretty far down the list of concerns for most Americans. Uh, in May, at the height of the controversy over the Arizona law, only 10% said it was their top concern. And uh, it was fifth on the list in, in, in general terms. At a time of high unemployment and uh, difficulties in uh, foreign affairs and um, the many other uh, concerns that preoccupy Americans, uh, immigration actually is is uh, not, uh, not near the top. A second uh, myth or misunderstanding is that mass public opinion shapes immigration policy. In fact, immigration policy, uh, more than most uh, public policies, is shaped by elites. And those elites uh, are more pro-immigration than the country is generally, than the public is uh, generally. 
Uh, and uh, I've explained why this is the case and uh, the extent to which uh, elites, for a variety of reasons, uh, tend to uh, control the direction of public policy uh, in this particular domain. Um, another very important feature of immigration politics is that it doesn't divide people along the traditional liberal conservative uh, axis. Uh, it creates very strange bedfellows. So, for example, in the, uh, in the more liberal side of the spectrum, you find labor unions uh, that have been very uh, much in favor of restriction of immigration in the past. That's changed a bit over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, but uh, labor unions are still quite ambivalent about, uh, about mm -hmm. immigrants. Uh, they now see uh, opportunities to organize them that uh, they felt didn't exist before. Uh, but by and large, and certainly historically, unions have been uh, opposed to uh, immigration. And that's also been true of, 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 of black, of African Americans and of other groups on the liberal uh, side of the spectrum. On the conservative side, you have the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal and many uh, corporations uh, that are conservative on a wide range of issues uh, tend to be very pro-immigration uh, for uh, both ideological and uh, economically self-interested reasons. And so the coalitions that form around uh, uh, positions on immigration policy are very opportunistic and not uh, the ones that you would ordinarily expect. Indeed, some of the most important restrictionist um, uh, groups in the United States are groups that are actually very pro-environmental and uh, population control uh, organizations. Uh, and they, ca they came largely out of the environmental population control and labor movements. Uh, and they believe that immigration poses a threat to uh, those particular values. Third myth is that U.S. immigration policy is becoming more restrictionist. And it's certainly possible uh, from the newspaper accounts and some of the debates that one finds on uh, cable TV to believe that. But in fact, uh, the number of permanent uh, admissions to the United States in recent years is at or very close to an all-time high. And very tellingly, Congress has passed no significant restrictions on immigration since 1996. And the 1996 restrictions were with respect to criminals uh, who were uh, uh, immigrants, not with respect to the admissions of, uh, of permanent, uh, alien, uh, permanent re resident aliens. Um, so the 1996 uh, law, although it's often pointed to as being uh, restrictive, and in many respects it is, and I see Professor Juliet Stumpf is here. Uh, she is an expert on the intersection between immigration policy and, and uh, uh, criminal justice policy. Um, uh, the, the, the law was directed uh, largely toward, uh, toward uh, criminal uh, aliens and illegal aliens. Um, Professor Stump, by the way, lived in the same building that I did at NYU. Uh, she also benefited, I think, from their, their great generosity. Um, fourth myth uh, is that Americans don't distinguish among immigrants. They treat immigrants as a generic category. In fact, American attitudes uh, are very positive toward legal immigrants, uh, even with respect to refugees and asylees, who uh, impose much greater fiscal burdens on communities in the United States uh, and who assimilate more slowly, uh, obviously because of their, uh, the exigencies that brought them to the United States, they are not as easily assimilated, they're not as well educated by and large, uh, they need more social services uh, to accommodate them, they suffer from a variety of anxieties and, and, uh, and fears that, uh, that make uh, uh, their settlement in the United States more, uh, more difficult. But, uh, Americans tend to be very sympathetic toward uh, refugees and asylees. When it comes to illegal immigrants, that's a different story. Uh, they're excluded, they've been excluded from most public services uh, and uh, increasingly subject to deportation, uh, especially under the Obama administration, which has uh, targeted uh, criminal uh, aliens who um, uh, are deportable. Um, in a variety, through a variety of new programs, including one that's especially controversial today called Secure uh, Communities. 
Um, uh, in, in fact, uh, as I was discussing with uh, Secretary Kobach today, the, uh, there are many states that have not uh, uh, followed in the spirit of the 1996 law and have actually continued to uh, provide uh, social welfare benefits to illegal aliens, even as the federal law in 1996 prohibited those benefits which are uh, uh, funded under uh, federal programs. Um, and in fact, uh, there are a number of states that, uh, that I'll, I'll come to this in a moment, uh, there are a number of states that have uh, tried to make life as easy as it is possible to make life, uh, given that they are subject to deportation, uh, for illegal aliens. My own state of New York is, and my, the city of New York is, uh, is leading that particular, uh, that group of jurisdictions. Fifth myth is that immigrants pay their way. Uh, in fact, uh, according to the most authoritative study, the National Academy of Sciences study in 1997, uh, they do pay their way, but only barely. Uh, according to immigration economists who have studied this, uh, uh, this uh, question very closely. Uh, there are more recent studies, and there are some groups uh, such as the uh, Heritage Foundation that have uh, concluded that actually immigrants don't pay their way um, uh, in general, uh, even when you take account of the tax revenues that their uh, economic activity and consumption uh, through sales taxes or through local property taxes uh, into account. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question to analyze, and there are different views on it, uh, but it's, uh, what seems very clear is that uh, uh, the uh, balance between the costs through social services um, and, and law enforcement costs and uh, costs on uh, the criminal justice system uh, that illegal aliens uh, pose um, uh, uh, balance pretty closely with the benefits that they, economic benefits that they, uh, that they generate. Except for sales taxes, most taxes they pay go to Washington. I call this a fiscal mismatch. I've written about this for a long period of time, and it creates a very... Uh, unfortunate incentives. Um, that is to say, the, it is states and localities that bear the full costs of providing public services to um, uh, illegal aliens. I, I didn't specify illegal uh, immigrants on, on this particular uh, slide, uh, section of the slide, but that's what I meant. Um, the taxes they pay go to Washington, usually in the form of uh, payroll taxes. Uh, and uh, income taxes to the extent that they uh, pay them, uh, but the costs of the services that are provided uh, fall heavily on uh, uh, counties and cities and, uh, and towns and, uh, and, and states. Uh, and I think, as I said, that that's uh, very unfortunate because it creates uh, very strong incentives uh, on the part of the federal government uh, not to uh, be as serious about enforcement as they would otherwise be if they were bearing the full costs. It's also important and, uh, and regrettable that the federal government, which has, uh, as a result of a congressional statute called SCAP, uh, State Criminal Assistance Something uh, Program, um, is supposed to reimburse the states and localities for the costs of uh, the criminal justice system costs that are imposed by uh, illegal immigrants and uh, uh, in fact, they, Congress, having enacted this uh, law, has not funded it uh, very greatly. So the vast majority of those costs are still borne by, uh, by uh, local governments. Um, the effect of illegal migration in the United States on uh, low-income workers uh, is, uh, is very disproportionate. That is to say, illegal immigration probably benefits most of the people in this room in the sense that it, uh, it uh, provides uh, services, they provide services that uh, reduce our costs, uh, many uh, services that we, uh, that we desire. Uh, they reduce the costs of our food and, and uh, uh, our um, uh, domestic help and, and many of the other areas in which they, uh, they uh, are um, uh, occupied. Uh, but the employment effects and the wage effects uh, that they uh, produce on low-income workers are, uh, are quite unfortunate. And uh, I think the best labor economics, 
econometric studies uh, suggest that even if illegal immigrants uh, were to benefit uh, the economy generally, uh, a point that uh, I've suggested is not well established, um, they do uh, increase the unemployment effects on low-income American workers and, uh, and reduce their wages or prevent their wages from, from uh, rising. Uh, sixth, and this goes back to a point I made a moment ago, the sixth myth is that state and localities are, are invariably hostile to immigration. In fact, Arizona accepts more refugees per capita than almost any other state. Very interesting uh, fact that, uh, so far as I know, uh, is almost never uh, mentioned. Uh, the view is that Arizona is, uh, is very, very hostile to uh, to uh, illegal immigrants or to immigrants generally, even though the Arizona legislation targets illegal immigrants, not legal immigrants. Many of the main destination states and localities give eagle, illegal immigrants some protection and some benefits. Uh, California just enacted a state dream act, which is designed to uh, protect, not only protect uh, 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 young people who are in illegal status uh, from uh, deportation, uh, but also to extend certain uh, benefits such as uh, in-state tuition uh, uh, rates and uh, scholarships uh, to them if they've met certain uh, criteria such as graduating from high school or serving in the military. Um, the, there have been initiatives by Utah, Washington, Maryland, and a number of other states to protect illegal immigrants uh, with respect to issuing them driver's license, uh, licenses, uh, in-state tuition benefits, and uh, New York just extended these benefits uh, to illegal uh, uh, immigrants um, and vowing not to participate, as the last uh, item uh, mentions, uh, not to participate in uh, secure communities uh, and to ignore the detainers that are issued by ICE, which is the uh, Federal Immigration Enforcement uh, Agency. This is all very, very uh, recent. Uh, seventh, 9-11 uh, and the aftermath uh, makes us, has made us less generous with regard to citizenship. In fact, there has been no legal change with respect to the acquisition or loss of citizenship. And the new naturalization uh, exam, which was adopted in 2005 or 6, I believe, is uh, even easier to pass uh, than in the past, according to most uh, analyses. Uh, there, uh, last year, there were 620,000 naturalizations uh, of, uh, of uh, legal immigrants. Uh, that's down from the last few years, but still very high historically. Um, uh, eighth uh, myth is that the illegal immigrant population in the United States is growing. In fact, it's down by about uh, one to two million uh, people uh, as a result of uh, uh, heightened enforcement by the Obama administration and uh, the economic uh, recession. Ninth, uh, immigrants are causing greater inequality in the United States. Uh, that may be true, but it depends a lot on whether uh, you're measuring inequality uh, to include the improved economic status that the immigrants themselves uh, achieve when they come to the United States. Uh, we absorb an enormous number of very poor people, very low-skilled people, uh, uh, mostly uh, from Mexico, but from other countries as well. And uh, that does, uh, as I suggested before, have some effect on the wage levels and employability of low-income Americans. Um, but on the other side, if, there, if you think the other side is, uh, is uh, to be taken into account, um, uh, th these uh, newcomers have gained enormously uh, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, effects of uh, their migration to the United States. Uh, wage levels in uh, the United States are about seven to eight times on average uh, the levels in Mexico. The last myth or misunderstanding I'll mention is that Hispanics threaten English dominance. In fact, uh, the English fluency acquired by the second generation, that is to say the children of immigrants, uh, basically tracks the historical path of English acquisition in, in previous uh, uh, cohorts uh, of immigrants. Although uh, uh, I hasten to add that the data on this uh, are a little difficult to evaluate because it's based mostly on self-reporting. That is to say, the second generation uh, people are asked uh, how often they speak English, how well they speak English, what, uh, what their level of mastery is. 
So we can't be absolutely sure about that. But most people who studied this believe that uh, they're not doing any worse than previous generations, the generations who we celebrate as having integrated well into uh, American life. Um, a, a few brief words on immigration reform. Well, there's an awful lot to be said. Uh, I, I will uh, uh, focus on a, on a few elements of immigration reform. Uh, let me say uh, in introduction that uh, um, many of the uh, uh, problems of American uh, immigration policy today uh, might be improved by, uh, by certain types of reforms, but uh, those reforms have not been adopted. And uh, they, it's not simply the Republican administration, uh, the Republican control of the Senate or for, uh, in previous years or in the House uh, now uh, are the major impediments. The uh, Obama administration uh, it, when it came in in 2009 uh, with a Democratic-controlled House uh, also did not adopt immigration reform. Uh, and indeed, the Obama administration, as I suggested before, has uh, ratcheted up the level of uh, uh, enforcement against criminal uh, aliens. So the first has to do with amnesty or legalization. Uh, 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 legalization is the, is the more politically correct uh, a term uh, because amnesty uh, smacks of uh, giving lawbreakers uh, uh, relief from their lawbreaking, whereas legalization has a somewhat more uh, uh, acceptable uh, resonance. Uh, there are many policy design variables in, in play in, in thinking about what a legalization program might look at. There are any number of uh, different elements uh, uh, of what uh, this program might include, and so it's very difficult to speak about uh, it in a, in a very general way. But what seems clear to me, and here I uh, differ, I think, from my, uh, uh, my friend uh, Secretary Kovac, I think a legalization program has to be liberal enough to induce illegal immigrants to apply for it, uh, because they always have the option of continuing the status quo, which is not pleasant for them by any means, uh, hiding in the shadows, uh, but it's still better than um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, being deported. So that's, for them, that's the trade-off. And, and to entice them into a program like this uh, means that uh, the provisions have to be uh, fairly, uh, fairly generous. Um, I believe that a more carefully tailored DREAM Act, uh, which I described earlier, uh, the one that I mentioned was in California, but at the federal level, uh, is a desirable uh, ch is a desirable change, but it has to be rigorous enough uh, that uh, it includes only those uh, young people who um, uh, have evidenced their uh, commitment to the United States and their, uh, their uh, willingness and readiness to um, advance their own education and acquisition of, uh, of human capital. And the DREAM Act provisions that were uh, advanced uh, and, and then failed in Congress uh, uh, were uh, not, I think, well, were not well drafted in those respects. Uh, there are a variety of morality and fairness issues. Uh, for example, uh, uh, should the, le the folks who are uh, eligible for legalization um, uh, be admitted before those who have waited online for uh, many years? Uh, and then another one, of course, is whether it's proper to reward people who have broken the law in the past. And I was suggesting to Secretary Kobach that one thing that we ought to do, clearly ought to do, is to advance the date for registry, which is a provision uh, that provides that if you have lived here since 1982 in illegal status and you have um, uh, been uh, in compliance with the law, uh, you can uh, get a green card. Um, I believe that that provision, which was enacted in 1986, ought to be updated so that somebody who's been here since, say, 1990 or 1995 and has met those conditions ought to be eligible for uh, legalization. And he pointed out to me that, well, that's simply rewarding people for having violated the law and gotten away with it for a long period of time. And I, I had to concede that that's the case. I, I don't think that's dispositive of the issue, but it certainly raises uh, a, a question of... Um, of uh, fairness and morality. 
Um, a second element of immigration reform that's very important, I think, is to increase the number of high-skill immigrants. Uh, I cited an article, that, a very recent article that I wrote on this subject. Uh, only 12% of the annual permanent admissions to the United States are skills-based. Uh, I think that is completely inadequate in terms of the needs of, and the needs of our uh, country. The H-1B uh, uh, category, which is uh, uh, temporary, uh, workers uh, who uh, have uh, relatively high skills uh, have been uh, reduced to only 65,000 a year. One third the number of uh, visas under the H-1B program were granted as recently as uh, 10 years ago. Uh, that seems to me to be most unfortunate. Uh, we're really cutting our nose to spite our face. We're, we're helping to educate and train folks and then sending them back after they have acquired the human capital that we need in this country. Um, uh, we increasingly have to compete for them and for foreign investors with other countries. Uh, it's no longer the case that they all want to come to the United States and they have no alternatives. They can go to Canada, they can go to Australia, they go go to a few other countries uh, uh, that also are attempting to entice them uh, with the prospect of uh, permanent resident uh, status. Uh, I just read today in the New York Times that uh, Senator Sh uh, Schumer has proposed a law that would uh, provide some additional visas to those who are willing to invest in American uh, real estate, uh, particularly uh, residential real estate, uh, to help absorb uh, some of the uh, homes that are underwater uh, uh, and, uh, and thereby reduce the, uh, the overhang of unoccupied uh, homes and thereby perhaps uh, reduce the, the length of time it's going to take for us to hit bottom in the housing market and begin to uh, recover. That's something I think ought to be uh, seriously considered. A third element of immigration reform has to do with seasonal guest workers. Uh, we need them. They need us. Uh, we have to insist that they are uh, working under fair conditions, uh, that they can return to the United States each season, uh, and that they will return home at the season's end. Now, having specified these conditions, I should add that it's very difficult to ensure that they will, in fact, return uh, at the season's end. Um, and uh, as one expert in the area of guest worker programs has said, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary guest worker program. A uh, fourth element is to repeal the per-country caps on permanent visas and accept more qualified, that is to say, high-skilled uh, uh, Mexicans. Um, uh, they, uh, we have, of course, a very, very long history uh, with Mexico, much of it uh, very uh, bitter and uh, conflicted, uh, but our two economies are very closely uh, interrelated, and uh, uh, we, I think, could benefit uh, from admitting more of those so long as they have the, uh, the skills to succeed in the United States. With respect to enforcement, uh, one very important uh, uh, prerequisite for increased effectiveness is something that's well below the radar of, uh, of uh, the headlines or the, uh, of, of the, uh, what is observed by uh, people outside of the immigration world, and that is you have to increase detention beds. That's a key limiting factor on enforcement. If there are no detention beds available, uh, then the uh, ICE uh, officials are not going to apprehend um, uh, uh, deportable uh, aliens and, and hold them. Um, and the detention beds have increased in number of, uh, very substantially in the last few years, uh, but there are still shortages in many cases, uh, and uh, that uh, that's a, it poses a great constraint on the ability to uh, enforce. Employer sanctions uh, have uh, not been strongly enforced in the United States. It's, it's, a, it's almost a joke, uh, and uh, that, there's uh, a lot to be said for strengthening uh, those uh, those sanctions. Uh, every administration promises to do so, and uh, few administrations actually do so. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's a strong case, and this is an article, uh, this is an op-ed that I wrote on the subject. I have a, a longer analytical article on the, on the topic. Uh, there's a strong case to be made for deporting criminal immigrants more quickly than they have been in the past. Once their rights to remain in the United States have been exhausted, once they've exhausted their appeals, uh, and uh, uh, what I uh, 
talk about in this in this uh, connection is that there's a statute, a federal statute that precludes deportation of uh, re of immigrants who can be deported. They're, 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 their deportability has been established and they've exhausted their appeals, uh, but they can't be deported until after they've served their a full sentence in, in uh, federal and state prisons. Uh, and why that, while that might make a certain amount of sense from a deterrence point of view, at a time when we are facing unconstitutional overcrowding in the prison system, uh, overcrowding that the Supreme Court in the last term uh, 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 prohibited, um, uh, this, it seems to me, is, is, is a high priority for uh, changing that provision so that they could be deported before they uh, go to American prisons where, uh, where they will be uh, subjected to um, overcrowded mm -hmm. conditions. Uh, it's very important, I think, to restore some of the official discretion over detention and deportation uh, powers that Congress withdrew in the 1996 law. Uh, the, there's, there's a need for greater uh, taking into account uh, the human factors and other factors that uh, ought to enter into decisions as to uh, who to deport and under what circumstance, even with respect to those who are clearly deportable as a matter of law. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the SCAP program ought to be uh, fully funded so that state and local governments uh, do not suffer from the uh, f suffer fiscally from the failures of federal immigration enforcement. In conclusion, uh, just a, a few points. Uh, first, that uh, our immigration has been one of our great successes. Our immigration, uh, uh, our immigration history and our immigration policy in the last 45 years has been enormously effective in uh, improving the quality of American life and in uh, diversifying our population in ways of which I think we, from which we benefit and of which we can be proud. We are unique in the world in this respect. Uh, secondly, the demographic impact of immigration is important for an aging population. Compare Japan and the EU countries uh, where the uh, birth, uh, where the fertility rates are well below replacement. Uh, they face very, very dire economic uh, prospects, uh, whereas the United States is, is a demographic outlier among uh, 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 modern uh, uh, post-industrial societies in having a, a high relatively high fertility rate. But we have to be able to select those we want based on our national interests, uh, except for asylees whom we're obliged to, uh, uh, to protect. Um, and uh, I've tried to suggest what our national interests are. They're primarily in, I think, a tr apart from the humanitarian admissions uh, uh, portion of our policy, uh, uh, they relate uh, primarily to uh, high-skilled immigrants uh, and, uh, and family unification of high-skilled immigrants. Uh, any reforms that we adopt will, will manage uh, the illegal migration problem. It will not solve them. Uh, there are many factors outside of our control, including a very long border uh, with Mexico, a massive migration, uh, geopolitical movements over which we have only very limited uh, control. Um, whoops, that's it. Let's see. Uh, uh, I, I guess part of that's hidden, but uh, the, the part that's hidden is U.S. political, economic, and ethical uh, forces uh, limit uh, what is uh, possible um, under these circumstances. So I think we need to be realistic about uh, our ability to, uh, to control uh, the uh, inflow of migration in today's world, but we can certainly uh, do a much better job than we have done before, and we can do a we can make sure that those who do, do come here are uh, uh, law abiding and uh, and are serving national interests uh, that we identify through our political process. Thank you. Now I understand there are going to be some. Questions? Professor Robinson. We have a few minutes for questions. A question for Professor Shaw. Yes. I'm having trouble hearing you, Julia.
I can't hear you. You better say it again. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, that's exactly what the point of the registry provision is. Uh, it's actually uh, not many people pay attention to it. Uh, prior to the 1986 uh, immigration reform, uh, the registry date was, I think, 1947. So at that point, um, if you were, uh, you had to be here 39 years in order to qualify. Uh, and of course, you had to be, you had to have uh, been. Uh, uh, free of uh, cr criminal activity during that period, and I, there are some other uh, there are some other uh, requirements that are relatively easy uh, to meet. Uh, so that was a 39-year period. Now, it, uh, in 1986, it was updated to 1982, and we're now uh, almost 40 years out. Uh, so even even based on the 39-year statute of limitations, I think uh, we're overdue for uh, for a, an updating of uh, that date. But the justification that Professor Stumpf uh, just indicated is, uh, I think, entirely applicable here. Uh, the passage of time creates certain equities, certain uh, ties to uh, the United States, certain expectations, uh, certain... Uh